Cyprus. On landing at Limassol in Cyprus, we took tea in a restaurant. The worst tea I have ever drunk. The worst bread and butter and the worst jam. The room was adorned with a picture of Lord Salisbury. I was restless to find that my first hour in Cyprus was being spent in such a place. It was as though I had been transported back to a second-rate eating house in Yeovil. It was exactly like that, with a large, discouraging cruet stand placidly set in the centre of a soiled tablecloth. And yet it was on the shores of this very island that Aphrodite first appeared, born of the salt sea foam. She could have done better had she been welcomed by the seasons in Dorset, her white limbs against the gleaming chalk, for I seldom have seen more dingy, cinder-coloured beaches. There were no fresh yellow sands as we know them, and no herring gulls with white breasts to balance and glide and cry in exultation. We reached the sea after a walk through dusty, unrefreshed plantations, separated from each other by sizzle hedges. The orange trees with diminutive oranges upon them were dusty. The olive trees and the pomegranate trees, the palm trees also. There was nothing to redeem the prospect, nothing to arrest our attention, save dejected mules walking round and round at the back of every hovel, pumping up water from the family well. These animals, abject in their subjection, were each one of the blindfold were each one of them blindfolded to prevent them falling down with giddiness. It was a little better when we reached the seashore and followed its wet, firm margin back to the harbour. At least the voice of the sea as it advanced and retreated had not lost its immortal cadence. The stars came out and we forgot all about the treadmill beasts and the dark stain of blood we had seen under the crushed body of a dead dog. We stopped at Larnaca the next day and I liked the place better. The sun was so hot that I burnt my hand by placing it upon the varnish of the boat. The town had a gay waterfront, gleaming with white houses. We visited the church of St. Lazarus, admiring much of its Byzantine bell tower and the old paintings contained within its walls, some of them representing the various tortures inflicted upon the bodies of the Christian saints. It was difficult to me not to think that these Christians were getting what they deserved when I looked at their contorted, fanatical countenances. After all, they had little to complain of. Theirs was a religion of suffering, and from the first, what a morbid satisfaction they have taken in celebrating their own misguided heroism. I regarded these pious panels with an unmoved eye. We went for a walk into the open country. At first we passed through plantations of eucalyptus trees and pine trees. The trees were sparsely planted, and yet how the smell of the needles brought back to my memory the higher slopes of the rocky mountains over which I used to wander, my senses stealthily on the lookout for any trace of moose or grizzly bear. We crossed some ploughed lands on the other side of the plantation, and then, coming up over a bank, we saw before us the wide level of a salt lake denuded of all water, stretching away as far as the eye could see. We did not at first realise that it was dry, because within a hundred yards of where we stood we saw water. However, as it vanished, or rather receded into the mid-distance as soon as we approached it, we concluded presently that it was but a mirage, which indeed was the fact. We skirted along the edge of the salt pan for a while or more. Each footfall we took crushed its crisp, caked surface, breaking up tiny brittle shells and flattening down the minute hillocks made by worms. We felt as if we were walking upon the back of a world-large alligator. After a while we came to an old church built on some rising ground which overlooked the strange, unexpected, dazzling desert. We reached the church by a sandy path covered with litter. The door was open as we entered. It was a village church, dim and religious. Every altar in Greek churches is entirely screened from sight. Apparently it is an important part of the priestcraft of the Orthodox Church. On our way back we passed a lonely garden with a fig tree in its centre. Just as we came up to it, a lusty vagabond with a stout staff vaulted over the roadside wall 
and, marching up to the tree as bold as brass, began thrashing down the fruit. I could see well that the rogue took only of the best. The scene pleased me. The man was wearing a green coat with tails like those of an Irishman, and in truth, he may have been of that nation, for aught I know. It was lucky for the tree that he found fruit on it. We overtook a troop of donkeys burdened with scrub. Each animal was completely hidden and gave the appearance of a round bush miraculously moving down the high road. Only their hooves were visible, pattering along on the dust. Coming into the back streets of the town, we saw a great deal of corn spread out in the sun, drying. In every case, women were sitting by it. I conjectured to keep the birds of the air away, though I had not seen any birds save an owl that flew out of a sandy hillock in the desert. 